Great. So welcome everyone to SHI Macrobotics. My name is Teron Myers. I'm the Director of Operations here at SHI. And for those of you who do not know about SHI, maybe you're you know, a counseling client or you're just someone just stumbling upon this meeting. Uh, we are a nonprofit 501c3 organization with our mission to be able to educate and empower individuals to create lasting health and lifestyle principles. And that's why we have these free webinars that we want to be able to provide education to individuals to learn about macrobiotics and different themes. I always use this disclaimer in the very beginning, just letting people know um, that any information that's shared here tonight by Denny is not, you know, personal medical or counseling advice. It's just information and education for you to be able to take and to apply to whatever you're already doing with a counselor or with your medical provider. Um, so our topic for tonight is going to be being flexible with common macrobiotic staples, which sure is a very, very popular topic that so many people are looking to hear about. Um, we'll have some updates toward the very end of this. So I say I would like to say to stay tuned for those updates and I have a very special surprise for those who hopped on early for this webinar. So if you want to know what that surprise is, you want to stay for the end of the updates as well, too. So I'm going to turn it right over to Denny, who's going to be, you know, heading this particular topic. As always, we'll have some Q&A toward the end, and I'll make sure to um, go back and forth between Zoom and Facebook. So thank you, Denny. You can take it away. Thank you, Tarad. And hi, everyone. Good to see so many people. Um, so I wanted to uh, do a really practical one, um, because there are food shortages and they're increasing and we don't know how serious it's going to get. So we have to, I think it's important to understand the best way to adapt our, our macrobiotic diet and practice. So the, the first thing, what is the macrobiotic diet? So macrobiotics is traditionally based, meaning based on all of the world's longstanding uh, cultures and their traditional cuisine. And we've taken the most unique points from each one and combined them together and called that the macrobiotic diet. It's not based on any one. So the common point, which I've said many times before, between all traditional diets is they're based on grains, beans, and vegetables, seeds, nuts, and fruits, natural fermentations, mild beverages, and mild sweeteners. And this is common throughout the world for, for 10,000 years. And if you break this down to modern scientific terms, the grains, beans, and starchy vegetables provide the prebiotics food for probiotics fermentation to grow on. So for prebiotics, we have two things. We have fiber. Then we also have resistant starch. So when grains, beans, and starchy vegetables cool, they create resistant starch, starch that doesn't really digest, but it's very good for the uh, microbiome, the gut environment. Then we have a whole host of natural fermentations from around the world. And the way I use these terms, I really should check on the actual definition. For me, a pickle has salt, and the fermentation doesn't. So pickles are fermented with salt, but vinegar is a fermentation. It doesn't have salt. Okay, so that, that, that's my definition. Now, Japan had a uniqueness because they added two things. Number one is soy products. Miso, shoyu, tofu, tofu tempeh natto, soy milk, edamame, all the traditional soy products, which is a lot of controversy, are they healthy or not? But the long and short of it is they're among the healthiest foods on the planet. Then they also included seaweed. And seaweed is a whole other category. And seaweed is more important than ever. At the same time, it's getting harder. I mean, the last time I saw the price on arame, arame seaweed or hijiki, it was like, $25 for a little bag. It was like, wow. So being a hoarder, we stopped out <laughs> on these things a few years ago. Um, just uh, didn't want to be caught short. So I, I'd hate to have to be in a position, but I'll talk about what, what's really most important uh, among those things. So this, this is the mainstay of the diet. So the point is, 
do you need the specialty Japanese foods to practice macrobiotics in a healthy way? And the answer is no, because outside of Japan and Asia, people weren't eating these foods and they had strong, vital, you know, creative lives. And they had great longevity, they lived, you know, to a ripe old age and died from old age. So no, you don't. At the same time, we're living in a unique environment of pollution that has never existed before, electromagnetic pollution, physical pollution, et cetera. And seaweed is one of the foods that does provide a high degree of protection against those foods. So next point, among grains, quinoa has become very trendy, very popular. And all my new clients, I mentioned, oh, I eat quinoa, I eat quinoa all the time. Well, that's nice, but quinoa is a wild grass. It's not a cereal grain. So the cereal grains are brown rice, barley, millet, wheat, corn, rye, oats, and buckwheat is also a wild grass. It's not a cereal grain. However, if you analyze the balance of nutrients, minerals to proteins to carbohydrates, Buckwheat is exactly in line with all the grains, whereas quinoa is not, teff is not, or none of the other ones are. So quinoa in, in you know, balance of nutrients is closer to a bean than a grain. Beans are higher in protein, and it's touted because, well, it's high, you know, high in protein. So I'm not saying don't eat quinoa, but the mainstay of our diet is grains. And one thing. If you stock up on one thing, and I'm going to go through the resource list of, of quality, you want to stock up on, on brown rice by far. But after that is barley, farro, and millet. And on my personal list, after those, I would I would put polenta and then I would put buckwheat. So even though buckwheat's not a grain, it really has many health values. So you want to try to find a variety of, of, of grains that you can you can rely on. And that can also include bulgur. Bulgur is also very good because it's a crack grain, but it's you know much closer to whole grain than, than many of the others. So um, that's important. Japanese azuki beans are getting harder and harder to find. I almost don't recommend them anymore because most people, you know, can't get them. But lentils, especially the French green lentils, I don't know about all, all of them, but we buy the ones from Shiloh Farms and they're grown on volcanic soil. Azuki beans are grown on volcanic soil. It's one of the uniquenesses. If you take an azuki bean and plant it here, in two or three years, you get a different bean. It, it won't reproduce. It needs that volcanic soil. That's the uniqueness. Well, the French green lentils are grown, at least the ones from Charlotte Farm, on volcanic soil, which means it's the closest bean to azuki bean and therefore the most important. And I've seen research on uh, the anti-inflammatory value of beans and lentils is by far the number one. You also have the uh, black lentils, which are very good. So as far as beans, you want to find a source or, or a stock up on green lentils, black lentils, and after that, chickpeas. After that, it's all other beans. I can't say they're all equal, but, you know, it's like, Grains are unique. They're the seed and the fruit combined into one without any separation. So they're providing the most complete and balanced nutrition. Vegetables, each one is unique. It provides a certain part, but we need a variety to really get the true value of vegetables. Beans are similar. So I don't want you to think just eat azuki beans. I mean, Lentils and chickpeas, all beans are valuable. But at the same time, 
as part of you know beans that you're choosing, choose lentils and chickpeas because they have, they have unique qualities for health. Now, macrobiotics had a very strict orientation, restrictive orientation for many years. And we at SHI have been endeavoring to widen and relax the practice. But one of the things that happens with a lot of people, when they do that, they forget some of the core and essential things. And that's something you do not want to do. So wide means you keep your core very strong, but then you build a wide variety around that. Then you have the most unique combination for health. I mean, that's just, that's essentially what, what we do. So we use a lot of the traditional Japanese dishes and we use a lot of other styles as well around that. But after grains, beans are the next most important food. And for many years in macrobiotics, beans weren't really emphasized much. But everyone needs more protein now. Everyone. We all have weaker digestive systems. Food has less nutrition. So, you know, it's almost instead of saying grains and beans, it's almost, you know, grouping grains and beans together, then vegetables and kind of a modern orientation. And then we, we come to sea vegetables. Now, sea vegetables are unique. Number one, they lower cholesterol. Number two, they block tumor formation. Number three, they help detoxify heavy metals and radiation both. They can encapsulate them, render them neutral, and pass them out of the body. And especially important now is protecting against, you know, radiation. And so we have, you know, electromagnetic and radio wave um, radiation like we've never had before. And um, I, I've been researching this. And I found out within a three mile radius of my house, there are 259 towers and about 2,500 antennas. 259 towers and about 2,500 antennas within a three mile radius of my house. I was totally astounded. And I, I'm looking in ways to, to block the, the EMFs, and I wanted to be prepared for tonight, but but I'm not yet. But for the next webinar, I will be. I, I've adequately adequately done my research and and tested out whatever, you know. I I think is is the best remedy. So uh, more to come on that. But I ha I have a good friend who's like an authority on many unorthodox things. And um, she sent me an email recently that to up my seaweed because she said gamma rays are off the charts. So, I mean, she checks, you know, all, all these things. So um, seaweed is one very important thing. And so I've always preferred the Japanese seaweed over the main coast, but I like the main coast too. But there are certain things, you know, I've said it many times, for many years, I had a Japanese friend. He was a student of George Osawa. He was an acupuncturist. I mean, the finest that I've known. And we've spent a lot of time together over the years in Japan and in Philadelphia and, and Boston. And he told me a few times, he said, America conquered Japan and tofu. We have fresh tofu ink. And every time he ate it, he said, this is the best tofu. It's better than any Japanese tofu. And it made me think, you know, we have an excellence in this country. I mean, I'm not a big beer drinker, but I do enjoy beer now and then. And I've traveled a lot and I've had the real Pilsner or Quill and, and Czech and all the best UK beers and in Ireland and German beers and Belgian beers. I've you know, 
each country I travel to, they like to show you, you know, their, their best beers. So I, I think I've had some of the world's best beers over, over many years. And if you ask me, there's so many IPAs here that are better than any beers I've had in, you know, anywhere else in, in the world. There, there's an excellence. So I think in time, the technology, I don't know if you call it technology, but the farming or cultivation of seaweed, you know, will become the best. But, you know, tofu, it's easy to excel because tofu you make in one day. So you can correct today's batch, you know, yesterday's batch today and, and so forth. So it, it's very easy to correct and adapt. Miso that takes two to three years, it takes a long time. It's going to take generations to, you know, to really perfect it. So I still have a preference, although I do eat domestic miso, we, we do, you know, for Japanese, but we're not talking about sea, seaweed right now. So out of all seaweed, the number one important seaweed is kombu. So while it's still available, I would stock up on Japanese kombu. It's the highest in iodine, which too much iodine is a problem and you don't want to eat too much. So when I say it's a good idea to increase seaweed, I'm talking maybe 10, 20%. I'm not saying double it, you know, in, increase a bit, a little bit goes a long way. The second most important one, I like talking about these things in the class where I can see people and actually ask questions, but that's okay. I'll talk to myself tonight, so. <laughs> and I hope you get it. <laughs> so, so number two is wakame seaweed in importance. And number three is nori. And nori is probably the only plant source of B12 where you actually get B12 from it. But I don't think it takes the place of, of a supplement for B12, but natural B12 has a unique value. And one of the things about nori that's so interesting is dogs, cats, and kids love nori. I mean, macrobiotic or not, I mean, you know, growing up, you know, when my kids were young, their friends would come over far, far from macrobiotics. I had to hide the nori. I mean, they'd devour it. So... There, there's some basic nutrient in nori that, you know, that especially for kids helps them helps them grow, helps them thrive. So in seaweed, they're the most important ones. You don't, I'm not saying don't worry about arame and hijiki. I'd put hijiki at the bottom of the list and arame is good, but it's still, it's far down from kombu, wakame, and nori. I mean, they're the ones that, uh, you know, Kombu is like for strength, while kame is for flexibility. So it, it's a very good combination. And nori is kind of like for freshness, something like that, like lettuce. Then we come to fermentation. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Probably the most interesting fermented, which is actually a pickle food on the planet is miso, because it's the interaction of a grain and a bean. And it has values for protecting against heavy metals, radiation, cancer, you know, you name it. And as I mentioned, we still have a preference for Japanese miso, but South River, who's on my resource list, is also, I think, you know, very, very good miso as well. And eventually we'll, I'm sure overtake Japan because one of the things, you know, well, these are all family in industries in Japan. And often when the, you know, the old man dies, the kids don't want to take it over and it's gone. There is, there is no more. We've seen so many valuable products um, disappear over the years. I mean, I was lucky enough to start in 1969 and get a, a keg of shoyu from Japan that was actually in a wooden keg. I'm trying to figure out, do I try to get the cork out, which I couldn't get out or loosen the band? Fortunately, when I decided to work on the cork till I got that open, I realized it's directly in the keg. I still remember the smell of that today, more than 50 years later, how, how unique it was. 
and how, how it's changed o over the years. But at any rate, uh, miso is by far the most important. After miso, I would say umeboshi plums, which are getting harder and harder to find. After umeboshi plums, I would say sauerkraut and kimchi. After that would be brown rice vinegar. And also on the list is unyeasted sourdough bread, which is natural fermentation. So what do we do if we can't get miso? That's a good question. Then you're relying on sauerkraut, kimchi, and homemade pickles. And it used to be everybody made pickles all the time. We used to, and I haven't for years, but recently I've been experimenting with really quick pickles. You know, you can start to eat them in a half hour, hour, and keep them for a few days. And they're amazing. Um, daikon pickles, Napa cabbage. So it's very easy to make quick pickles. You also have salt cured olives. Problem is most of them are very salty, but you can find mild ones like we like Castel Voltrano, which are these green mild tasting ones, not very salty. So olives are, are a good natural fermentation as well. But everybody needs fermentation. If you can't get miso and, and shoyu, then you're relying on vegetable ferments for, for the most part, which are still, you know, they work very, very well. But especially for detoxification, you know, science is catching up with four or 5,000 years of oriental medicine, realizing the importance of, of the health, of the health of the microbiome for health and immunity and, and everything else. So fermentation is one thing we need because we got to keep our gut healthy and it helps counter against pollution and stress as well. Beverages, kukicha is still the most unique beverage there is from, from loose twigs. But you also have roasted barley tea, which is getting harder to find. But you also have roasted dandelion root tea, which is also a very good one. So if kukicha disappears, I would say out of all the herbal teas, roasted dandelion root is, is one of the most unique ones. Now, water is, is a huge one. The quality of water. Um, I don't trust bottled water at all. Um, it's, it's an unregulated. I mean, there's a documentary uh, called TAP that's worthwhile seeing if you really want to know about the bottled water industry. And um, we, we've been using Pro One uh, when I get through the, and um, another friend who's really into high quality food, a Russian friend, he sent me an email yesterday saying, you were right again. We changed to Pro One and it, it, it is the best water. It's, <laughs> which, <laughs> that, that's Susan on my reaction. So um, let's, let's go through, through the resource list. I've, I've made some very good finds. So for Japanese products, natural imports, you, which used to have everything and have, they're having such a hard time, uh, the FDA is not making it easy on them. You also have Eden, you have gold mine and natural lifestyle. So you want to search for those, but further down uh, on the second play, page is a place called Toiro Kitchen. And they have a lot of specialty, high quality Japanese foods like I've never seen, plus cookware. Not inexpensive. You know, take your wallet or pocketbook with you when you when you go to the website, but it's very high quality things that that are amazing. As I said, for water, pro one, and there's a, a link on the bottom I'd appreciate if if you'd use it. Uh you become very good friends. And um, basically what they did, they took Berkey technology and improved it and, and did a good job. So they have gravity filters. They have pressure filters. We have a whole house filter, which I absolutely love. Um, the first shower I took after we got a filter, I couldn't believe the difference. And we had a shower filter. 
Then for bread, if you're in the Philadelphia area, Sweetwater Bakery bread is the real deal. It's wood fired, brick oven, uh, stone ground, local source grains. Uh, the baker's actually healthy. Bread alone, I don't know personally, but in New York, they're a good choice. But I made a great discovery through a client, and it's on their one, two, three dough bakery in Pound Ridge, New York, it's somewhere in, in upstate New York. And it's an heirloom grain bakery. And I talked to them today, and I'm actually going to order, they'll ship anywhere in the country. So, um, what you want is the lightest bread they have because ancient grains tend to make very dense bread. And let me see, the one he said uh, was the light, lightest one, least dense one. So he said the uh, Amer uh, American einkorn sourdough is probably the, the lightest bread, which which I would suggest. And after that, he said the uh, rye sourdough, which is not available right now, but probably be back. But so if you don't have a source for good unused sourdough bread, check them out. Um, never been there, but I, I was very satisfied with our conversation. Um, <clears throat> SI salt is the salt we recommend. David Jackson, usually if you call him up, he'll just mail you the salt. I've heard he's out of the salt, so you can try gold mine or uh, natural lifestyle. I believe they sell it. And people were criticizing it, saying it's computed with polluted with microplastics, which, which it is, all salt is, even land salt. Um, and people are saying, well, eat Himalayan salt because it's lower, but on the scale, it's one point lower than um, SI salt, which is very low compared to other sea salt. So we're, we're sticking with SI salt, and I, I recommend you do as well. Then um, for cookware, you have Soko Hardware in San Francisco and Toiro Kitchen. So I, I, would I would definitely check those out. They um they have they have both have wonderful products. And um cutting boards. I just ordered a cutting board for Susan today from Toyo. They have for an inexpensive price an amazing cutting board. I mean it's um anyway, I can't say enough about the products. Then if a little down, housework store and well spent market uh both have Coda Farms rice, Kokua Rose organic heirloom brown rice. And I would suggest if you stock up on one grain, make it cocoa rose. It's not inexpensive, but even in the natural food industry, organic food industry, everyone for profit hybridizes their grains. I don't know if Charlotte Forms does. I presumably probably don't, but at any rate, um, most everyone does. And as they hybridize and they increase the yield, the nutrition goes down. Well, Kokura Rose, the organic heirloom brown rice, they've never done that. It's grown for quality from day one. It's, it's a unique quality in brown rice. So uh, there's two sources. And I talked to Well Spent Market today, and I, I would check with them first. I, th I think they'd be the most accommodating when coming up with the best shipping to, to get it to you. Then you also have Azure Standard. Um, they have a wide variety of organic foods. Kavala has organic tannin black tahini and tannin black sesame seeds. And uh, the black tahini is absolutely wonderful. It's messy, it gets over everything and it stains. So you, you've, you've been warned. <laughs> I don't know why it's so messy, but it is. Then South River Miso Company, you can get miso from them, 
but also toham tahini. It's a traditional Turkish tahini that's very, very unique. And then for clothing, you have packed, which is local, and then green fibers in the UK. And they both have uh, great uh, organic clothing and towels and underwear and all kinds of other things. And um, being a natural born skeptic, since I came into contact with um, organic cotton, I'm a real fan and you know, highly, highly recommend it. There's a huge difference. And then one other thing that didn't make the list, and I was saying was people ask me from time to time, where do you get Japanese knives? So there's a place in New York called Korin, K-O-R-I-N, <coughs> Korin.com. They have knives from $65 to $6,500 to give you an idea. So after looking for an hour or two and going through all these knives, I just decided to get the knife designed by the owner of the company, which I absolutely love. It's, it's just a wonderful knife, not too expensive. Um, and it, it just has a good feel and keep, keeps a good edge. So that's, I, I think, um, everything that I wanted to say. Um, so for soy products, for the foreseeable future, tofu will be available. And uh, I do recommend tofu and soy milk to everyone as, as part of a healthy diet. And, you know, while these things are still available, please, please do stock up. But anyway, if you have questions, I'll try, try to answer your questions. All right, thank you so much for that, Denny. So at this time, we're gonna move forward with our Q&A segment. Um, I'm just gonna ask if everyone can just hold their questions for just a little bit. There's been a number of people who have been sending them throughout. Um, so I have some questions to catch up on. And we also will have questions that are gonna be coming through um, on Facebook as well too. But for now, I'm only gonna do questions that are in the chat and then I'll be able to take some verbal questions, but there's quite a few questions in the chat. Um, so just, just bear with me as I scroll through a little bit. And as I mentioned, if um, we can just hold our questions until um, I give a, a quick note. Um, Denny, one thing, I, if you can mention again, because I think you said that it was not in the resource list, you had mentioned the website for the knives. What was that website again? K-O-R-I-N dot com, Corin. They're in downtown New York, um, below, below Soho. Um, so if you have a way to get to New York, it's worth worth a visit. But they they really know <clears throat> knives. It's a great resource. And I've got one other important thing. If I had to choose one green and one green only for the rest of my life, it would clear, clearly be Napa cabbage, Chinese cabbage. And I think it's often overlooked because people think, well, it's not dark green, but it, it is by far the most unique leafy green vegetable. So even if it's not organic, I, I would have it as a regular in my diet. All righty, thank you. And just as a reminder, the resource list will be sent out with the recording of this webinar tomorrow. Um, I can also, it'll, it'll also be sent here a little bit earlier through the chat for those who may have missed it, but it will be emailed out to everyone um, who registered through Zoom and the email of the recording. If you're on, if you're on Facebook, um, just maybe leave a message in the comments on Facebook. Um, and we'll also try to find other ways that we can have it access, access, accessible on the SHI website. Um, I'm going to move into some questions right now because we definitely have quite a few that we want to get through. And we'll probably extend the time a little bit until 8. Um, so let me just check here. And right now the chat is disabled just because we have a number of questions. So until we get through these, I'll be able to open up again here. So let me just go through. Um, so I know, Denny, you mentioned um, Tofu Inc., but I know you also mentioned the idea of, you know, probably other brands as well, too. So for people who have trouble um, getting Tofu Inc., if you can just give a reminder of, you know, what tofu they should be looking out for. The single most important thing is organic non-GMO. 
hands down, that's the most important. Second, if it's made with nigari, magnesium chloride, that's what you want to look for. And without calcium chloride, but even if it has both, that, that's okay. But as long as it's organic, non-GMO tofu, you know, I, I, I would eat it personally. After fresh tofu ink, you have the bridge if you're in the Connecticut, New York area, which is, which is excellent as well. All righty, thank you, thank you. Let's see, so we our next question is, what about seaweed from China, even if it's organic? What do you think? I don't know. I really, really don't know. Um, some people said it cannot be trusted. Yuzo, who was the buyer for seen for many years, said that's not true. Uh, some of the companies, the macrobiotic companies, their seaweed is reliable. Um, so I, I don't really know. I mean, I look for Japanese seaweed. My second choice is, is Maine Coast. All righty, thank you. Thank <clears throat> you. Um, our next question, can miso get too old? Yes. It doesn't spoil, but it loses its taste. So the taste of miso peaks between two and three years. After that, it goes down. The strength still you know, in, increases. So if you eat, you know, 10-year miso, which I've had, doesn't taste very great, but it's strong and nourishing. But you really want to try to consume your miso as much as possible between two and three years. But as long as it, and if it molds, just scrape off the mold. That's It's not harmful mold. Unless it gets really funky, eat it. Sometimes it gets a really kind of rank smell and taste, then you got to discard it. All right, thank you. Just peering back and forth through the Facebook. So our next question here, Denny. So can you address the plastics, microplastics, and endocrine disruptors in our environment that we ingest, inhale, et cetera, and how to deal with it in the body? The macrobiotic diet and lifestyle, body rub, walking outside, sun. We can't avoid pollution. Pollution is everywhere in everything. Um, I'm much more worried about glyphosate personally and, and microplastics. So um, the number one on my list is avoid GMOs and, and glyphosate. But if you can find foods, of course, that have less microplastic pollution, but I, I don't know how much they exist. But, you know, grains, beans, because of phytic acid, um, miso and seaweeds, Umugoshi plums, um, pukicha give the best protection against all environmental pollutants. You know, I, I've met people, met them people who were seriously burned in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and who made complete recoveries through, through macrobiotics. Um, amazing, I mean, astounding. So the power of good food is, you know, it is amazing. And Colin Campbell's uh, response is, you don't need to worry about it. If you eat enough healthy food, it automatically detoxifies the unhealthy food. Now, I don't know what, you know, where at what point the body will get overwhelmed and can't. But, you know, the only thing we can really do, and it doesn't help to worry about it, is eat a wide variety of the foods we're talking about. Chew your food, walk outside, get plenty of sunshine as much as you can. <clears throat> all righty thank you uh, so going back to the concept of knives i had a question um i don't know how you pronounce it but it maybe it's caddy c-a-d-d-i-e denny um a knife that was very popular is that a, a knife that you still recommend or does it matter well i don't i don't know i haven't i mean i know the name from the past i haven't seen one from years um, in macrobiotics, there's always recommended a vegetable knife, which is kind of like a rectangular shape, but I decided to go 
to Santoku knife, which is pointed on the end, because I think it has much, much more utility and, and flexibility. So that I mean that that's that's what I would choose. And um Soko hardware, you can probably find some good knives. Toiro has some knives. And if you want a specialty knife, go to Corin. All righty, thank you. Uh, so this question is in regards to, um, I guess, bread again. So, Denny, do you know or are you familiar with the Berlin Bakery in Ohio? Spelt sourdough, unyeasted, no extra ingredients. I am not. But there are more and more sourdough bakeries springing up everywhere. So, and a lot of them are bound to be very good. So the really important thing, if they have stone ground flour, you know, or especially organic stone ground, because the stone doesn't destroy the integrity of the grain and is far more low temperature, whereas a steel mill generates a lot of heat. It really negatively impacts the grain and the integ integrity of the grain. <clears throat> So if you're going to find, so ancient grains, uh, <coughs> sorry, anyone who's using ancient grains is, isn't the quality, you, you know, and then if they're using stone ground flour, they're the uh, organic, that, that's what I would look for. But um, if they have, you know, it's just flour, salt, and water, that, that's, that's usually a good sign too. All righty, thank you. Another question in regards to grains, what do you really recommend to people who are gluten sensitive or intolerant as that's a big thing these days? Well, I had that conversation today. So a lot of people who are gluten intolerant can eat as heirloom grains without any problem. But to me, a healthy person can eat the world's healthy foods. And the gluten grains are among the healthiest foods on the planet. And as I said before, I, you know, I wonder about things for a long time. And I wondered why um, Shoji Miyuri put such a, you know, high preference on, on Fu and Seitan, concentrated wheat gluten products. And I discovered not only um, for great strength and vitality, but gluten actually activates the immune system. So to me, gluten sensitivity means it's trying to get rid of unhealthy foods you've eaten from the past. And, you know, when we did our year-long program on site, we had a ton of people that came in gluten sensitive or gluten intolerant and left fine, com completely fine. So reintroduce high quality gluten products little by little to overcome the sensitivity. That That's really my best. Uh, I, I do not think having a gluten-free diet for a long time is healthy in any way. All righty, thank you. Um, so the next two questions are kind of the same theme. Maybe I will start with, well, I'll do this. How do you suggest using soy milk? Drink it. <laughs> for a special treat, get some organic uh, cornflakes or rice krispies, but my favorite way for soy milk is just drink it. I had a glass tonight. <laughs> All right. And this follows up to that question, soy milk versus rice milk. Soy milk, I think, is, is unique. Unfermented soy products protect against hormonal cancers, male and female. Um. You know, soy milk wasn't really a part of macrobiotic practice for a long time. Susan and I have it as, as a regular basis. And I, I do think it's a healthy addition to a, an overall, you know, healthy, varied diet. Now, if you make genuine rice milk, the way we have in our, our counseling book, we were, you know, soaked overnight, 10 to 1, cooked with kombu and put through a sieve, well, that that's that's different. That, that 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 that's a wonderful food. All 
All righty, thank you, thank you. So at this time, um, the chat has now been enabled again. So if you do have questions, you can send them to the chat. I can also take verbal questions. So I just ask that you can unmute yourself and just wait to be called upon just so multiple people are not speaking at the same time. So if you have a question, um, the the mic may be the, the fastest way. So Nancy, I see you have a question, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, um, on um, uh, stocking up on some of these things, how long would uh, your grains like brown rice, how long can you keep it at room temperature? And, and store it? And also, do you refrigerate your grains? If you want to keep them for a long period of time, refrigerate them. We do refrigerate our rice. It can keep for a long, long time refrigerated. And so, at room temperature, is it like, how, how soon would you need to use it? I mean, I don't, it depends on what, you know, what the temperature is. I'm for wine, 70 degrees, once it gets above that, really affects the quality. So I would assume grain is, is somewhat similar. Um, so, um, you know, we go overboard on these things. Susan bought an extra refrigerator so could, we could refrigerate our rice. Yeah. <laughs> we stock up one. And um, I think it's a wonderful idea. Because it, it does it does preserve the taste and the, and the quality. And can you freeze it? You can. Some people say just freeze it, but the only time I would freeze it if it gets weevils or worms to kill them, freeze it for four days, and then you know wash it well and get rid of many of the weevils and worms as you can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if we can hold our questions yet again, please. Uh, they're just coming through. <laughs> um, Gerard, I, I see you have a question. Feel free. Thank you. Hello. Uh, just uh, have you come across any alternatives uh, to umeboshi, similar to umeboshi? I don't think there is one. I mean, umeboshi is unique. After miso, I think it's the next most unique fermented food on, on, on the planet. And um, I, I, I don't. If you can still find good Japanese umeboshi, the ones the natural import sells, I, I would stock up on them. And uh, I imagine in, in Europe then from Clear Spring. That's right. I've got, uh, I bought all the free ones on the local nature shops around the place. So I have about three small jars of it now. Yeah, I don't know about, I haven't had any contact with Chris Dawson from Clear Spring, but I would I would try to check with them and, and see. Is the umeboshi paste also good? For taste, it, it doesn't have the same quality as the plum. Mm. Yeah. All righty, thank you. And so, I was just going to say that I have the plums from National Import and they crystallized in the refrigerator. It's because you didn't have them sealed well enough. Oh. Umeboshi okay. plums don't spoil. It okay. spoils, it's not an umeboshi plum. I mean, there are some disease batches which spoil, that means it's, um, but at any rate, they dry out. The nature of umeboshi plum is drying. The reason it, it's so good for digestion, it, it absorbs all the excess moisture in there and it creates the, the right balance. So, and they protect against environmental humidity, warm humidity, which we have in, in this country and they have in, in Japan as well. So you've got to keep them really well sealed. Otherwise they dry out. So once they dry out, use them in cooking. Okay. You can use them to make soft rice or, you know, umisho bunch of tea, right? Anything like that. But they're not very good to eat once they're about 20% salt. So once the salt comes out, they're not very good to eat. All righty. Thank you. Um, Audrey, I think I saw your mic was unmuted a second ago. Did you still have a question?
I had one other question, but I don't want to monopolize. Oh, I'm sorry. I see. Okay, I see. It went back and forth. Okay, no worries. <laughs> Thank you. All righty. So, Gary, did you um, have a question? Gary, um, Adam? Yes. Um, I've read a lot about arsenic in brown rice, and I was wondering how you deal with that. First of all, California brown rice is low in arsenic. Southern brown rice, because of tobacco and cotton and arsenic-based pesticides, might be, but it's a worldwide problem. Mm -hmm. And Codiform's brown rice is very low in arsenic. Now, having said that, we recommend always cooking brown rice with another grain. So if there should be an arsenic problem, which I, I, don't, I don't think there is, then the other grain would help take care of it. Worldwide, rice-eating people have less cancer than, than others. Mm. So, but, you know, you've got to check your water supply and uh, other uh, sources of arsenic. That, that's important. Mm. Okay. Thank you. All righty. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone who has their hand up at this time or unmuted, um, I will get to you as soon as possible. We do have a number of questions that came through in the chat um, prior. So let me just try to get through those. Um, the time is now 7.52 Eastern. We'll try our best to get through as many of these as we can. I know a lot of people have tons of questions about food. So that's always great. Um, so let me just see if I can get through these. I see a number of questions about um, non-dairy milks again. So Denny, soy milk or almond milk for kids? Okay, I, hands down, I recommend soy milk, but you can use some rice milk or almond milk or oat milk if they're if they're good quality and simple ingredients. I mean that, that's that's okay. I mean, you know, healthy foods have very few ingredients. So that's you know you know look for organic with few ingredients, and you know ki kids can have a lot more things in a healthy way. So I wouldn't worry about it. Okay, and do you have a comment regarding soy milk versus any other type of unsweetened grain or no, nut milk? Well, I mean, soy milk is the, is the most traditional as far as I know, but it's a, it's the same answer. If you like to use those other milks, almond milk, etc., then find one that's really high quality with a very few ingredients and organic. Okay. I mean, soy milk, e, you know, Eden has gone to incredible lengths to find sources of foods that are reliable that can supply them. And I mean, it's a macrobiotic company. It's the last holdout. It hasn't sold out to, to big food. So that speaks volumes. Yeah. Right? They're, they're there for as long as they can to pr provide quality. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, once again, everyone, I'm going to have to uh, close the chat down. There's just so many questions. I want to make sure that we get to as many as possible. And Erica, I still see your hand. Don't worry, I'll get to you. Um, let us see here. Um, Lisa, Lisa B, maybe if you can elaborate on this question. I see you have Amasake and Dolph's question. Do you have questions about um, brands or questions about, you know, if it's something oh. good? Thank you. Hi. Um, no, I'm just, I'm, I meant to ask you about Amazaki. Um, just in general, every once in a while. I can't find it, but I might be able to find it at Erwan, a specialty store here. But I wondered what you thought about Amazaki. The second question was dulse. Unrelated. <laughs> Amazaki is a wonderful food online. You can find clear, clear spring Amazaki. You can still get the Japanese Amazaki. Um, I don't know um, if Rhapsody is making Amasaki or not anymore. I don't really know. Um, but yeah, if you have a source um, for good quality Amasaki, it's wonderful food. Dulce is wonderful. It's salty. Yes. So you have to have to be careful. It's a red seaweed, so is nori. I mean, so I would choose nori over dulce, but 
to use some dulse here and there is, is very good. Um, if I lived in, you know, Nova Scotia or Ireland or one of those places, or Scotland or UK, dulse would be a, a regular. I think it, it suits the climate very well. Okay. Thanks, Danny. Thank you. Um, so, Danny, would you recommend people making their own soy milk? I don't know. I've never tried to make it. I'm lazy. I say if you can buy it, it's good quality. Buy it and spend your time making other things you can't buy. I think that's, you know, I think that's a much better approach. So a lot of people say, well, I'll make my own sourdough bread, but it's an art. And not to offend anybody, I haven't had seen a lot of great homemade sourdough bread. So in the, unless you really have the touch, baking is a touch. Some people have it. <laughs> and, and some people don't. So whatever you can buy that's well made, I, I would buy it. And then spend your time making things you can't get. You, you're going to end up with much more that way. All righty, thank you. Um, so this is going back to the gluten-free question. So Denny, do you have a comment regarding someone who has Hashimoto's told, who was told to eat a, a gluten-free diet? Hashimoto's thyroid. Yes. No, I think that and avoiding that and avoiding cruciferous vegetables is now I, I, I recommend those things to all my clients and they 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 improve, they get over it. So no, I, I don't I don't pay any attention to that. Thank you. Um kimchi three times a week. Is that good as a part of a macrobiotic way of eating? Kimchi is wonderful. It's very unique. It it depends on your health and your capacity for salt and the quality of the kimchi. But uh, sauerkraut is wonderful and kimchi are wonderful and just a combination if you're okay with the spice. All right, thank you. Erica, I don't want your figurative hand to be up for too long, so you can you can ask your question now. <laughs> Danny, I wanted to ask you if you eat the seeds of the umeboshi pits. Not anymore, my teeth are... Or not strong enough. I did it one time. No, I don't. I mean, <laughs> cracking the come on. When, when cracking were, the nut, but when they're really well aged and you, you know it's so so soft enough, you can just I, I have eaten them, and it, it is okay to eat them. I mean, yeah. I had a daughter who zoomed though she crazy. She ate them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I like them too. <laughs> All right, we have about maybe four or five questions here. Some of them are pretty simple. Denny, do you have a comment about tamari versus shoyu? Shoyu. Uh, tamari is a different food. Um, shoyu has a unique gathering, concentrating quality. Tamari doesn't at all. Tamari was originally a, a byproduct of being miso. It was used as a dipping sauce for, for raw fish. So health-wise, it's shoyu. Okay. Let's see. I've been told that a bay leaf in a container of grains keeps the bugs away. I don't know, but it's worth a try. There's a lot of traditional remedies that are good and they work, so. Ah, okay. So I don't think this was actually, was this asked already? Umaboshi paste versus the plum. Okay, that was asked. Okay. It's not the same quality. The only way we use umaboshi paste in the summer, fresh corn on the cob with some umaboshi paste, wonderful. Other than that, we use the plums. Okay. Um, Denny, I think you mentioned com combining other grains with rice as taking care of the arsenic. Can you um, elaborate on that a little bit, on how that happens? Well, rice, all grains and beans have phytic acid, which has the ability to encapsulate 
and heavy metals, including arsenic. So I think the synergy between the two, I mean, I've seen research that if you cook rice and barley together, you get more nourishment from the rice and from the barley than when cooked separately, which is consistent with, you know, my approach to, to macrobiotics. But just from my understanding, so if you cook a different grain with rice and there should be arsenic in the water from soaking it, that other grain will absorb the arsenic, render it neutral and pass out of the body. But the bottom line is, you know, I've been doing this a long time. People that eat good brown rice have better health. I mean, it's, you know, the taste, proof is always in the taste of the pudding. It's, it's right there. And epidemiologically, worldwide, rice-eating people have less cancer than other people. So, and everything healthy is under attack. So uh, I wouldn't pay attention. Get good organic California brown rice. Cook it with another grain. All right, thank you. And I think this is our our this is going to be our last question. I think it goes very well. Um, so that and I know you actually are a fan of this. So the question asks, do you know Blue Moon Acres medium grain rice and what do you think of it? I highly recommend it. Jim Lyons is a great guy, a great farmer, and um, you know, he he grows high quality foods. His rice is, is wonderful. I think it's the best dry land rice that, that I've had. So um, I, you know, I, I highly recommend it. Excellent. And, you know, it's, I mean, patty rice, we don't, we don't know about the future. So dry land rice may be the future. And, you know, he does, he definitely does a good job. So just in closing, I say, you know, we're talking about the highest quality foods on the planet. That, that's really what this is a collection of. So do your best to find, you know, um, heirloom ones that are not too hybridized, organic, and stock up the best, the best you can, you know, try to, because we don't know what the future is going to bring. It's always better to be safe. Salt will last a lifetime if you keep it dry as seaweed. I mean, it'll last decades. You know, grains can last for a couple hundred years, but you don't have to think of the terms, you know, just several years supply or even two or three years. Beans, after a while, they, they won't get soft. So, that, that, I mean, that's a problem. But then you have eaten canned beans. So, anyway, in, enjoy. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you, Denny. Um, as we close, I'm just going to share my screen really quickly. I mentioned the very beginning for those who want to know about the special prize, just hold on just a, a few more minutes uh, before we wrap up for the evening. I just want to give everyone some updates about what's happening in SHI and what the next webinar is actually going to be. So I'm just going to share my screen really quickly. I know we went over um, just a little bit, but I know everyone really enjoyed the information. So I'll give everyone an opportunity to give Denny their appreciation and thanks, of course. Uh, but let me just see here. Denny, just let me know when you can see the screen and it's fully loaded. Good to go. Disclaimer, I see, yeah. All right, so there's that disclaimer again, just reminding everyone once again that this information is just for educational purposes. This is not to substitute any counseling or medical advice. As always, the recording for this will be available. It, it's already available on Facebook if you follow Denny's personal or professional counseling account. You can find this recording immediately. So if you just want to watch this all over again, it's right there now. Um, but through the Zoom recording, I'm going to send that out in an email tomorrow, along with that resource list, as well as links of other things that I'm going to talk about in a few seconds. Just stay connected. Of course, SHI and Denny can be found on different social media platforms, such as Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, as well as LinkedIn. These are just some quick snapshots of how you can find those accounts with the type in. <clears throat> Also, too, what is our next webinar topic? So we're going to have another webinar in a month from now. Um, the exact date is still pending, but it will be a Wednesday, and it's going to be December at this exact same time of 7 p.m. Eastern, and it's going to be about time-restricted eating for optimal health. So, of course, that's very, very, you know, very popular, something that Denny recommends to his clients and talks about quite a bit in regards to you know, very much being scheduled with the food that you're eating. Um, so that's very big right now. So we're going to have a link for you to be able to register for that, you know, tomorrow when I send out that recording, but that will be our next topic. 
Also, too, we're going to have something that Susan is going to be holding next month as well, too. It's going to be festive holiday dishes. It's going to be a holiday themed cooking class, which is going to be Wednesday, December 14th at 5 p.m. Eastern. So it's going to be a two hour cooking class with a minimum contribution of $35. So it's going to be absolutely amazing. Here's a, a snapshot of some of those dishes that Susan is going to be covering. Um, fresh cabbage fennel slaw, Portuguese fish rice, candy sweet potatoes, sauteed winter greens, dried fruits. It all sounds very, very amazing. My mouth is watering right now and I already ate. Um, so I'm pretty sure so many people are going to be very, very excited about that. <clears throat> and this is actually the special announcement that I wanted to say. So we have one winner who's going to get a, um, a complimentary registration for this cooking class. So I'm rewarding people who hopped on the call early. So the first 30 people, I threw you all in a quick little raffle that I did about a few minutes before this closed up. And so our winner for a complimentary registration to Susan's festive holiday dishes is going to be Lisa Behoof. So you have a free registration to that class. So, you know, congratulations, Lisa. You know, everyone say congratulations in the chat as well, too. So I'll follow up with you on instructions on how you can access that class, but this is live on our website right now. I'll have a link for everyone to be able to register for this as well, too, when I send out the recording. As always, we have courses at the beginner level up to the advanced level, counselor training that you can take part in as well, too, through SHI. And we have lots of free, free resources in addition to these blogs. Uh, in addition to these webinars, we have blogs, there's recipes that you can find on the website. And of course, too, Denny has his book, Denny and Susan's book, The Ultimate Guide to Eating for Longevity. So we definitely, you know, you know, encourage people to share all these different resources that really don't, you know, cost much of anything, but just to, of course, to share. Um, and then just lastly, we always appreciate all the support of individuals. We have a number of individuals who are on this call who are donors. Honestly, all of your support, even just being live on this call, is just you know allowing for us to continue to offer things like this. As I mentioned before, the you know the mission of SHI is just to educate and empower individuals through these different um, create lasting health through themselves. But you know your support really means a lot to allow us to continue having these events. Of course, since 2020, everything being mostly online, um, so just showing up. And the opportunity to be even to you know donate is really, really huge for us here at SHI. It helps us all. Um, SHI is really just Denny, Susan, and me. So we're trying to constantly expand our operations as, mu as much as possible. And I don't know, Denny, even if you wanted to uh, comment just very briefly about that as well, too, before we finally close. Yeah, I mean, as Teron said, you know, our, our work is more important than ever before with the health, you know, the world failing at a, at a rapid rate. And so we're really trying to expand our capabilities and resources. But as Tehran said, Mises and Tehran, there's only so much that, that we can do. So your support in any way you can support us uh, makes all, all the difference in the world and enables us, you know, to do this and, and you know, have, have more and more offerings. So thank you for being part of this and uh, look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And for everyone who wants to maybe unmute yourself, you can also give your appreciations that way. The chat's been blowing up for the last couple of minutes, giving thanks. So thank you so much, everyone, for participating. Thank you so part. much. Thank, thank you, Danny. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Danny. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank everyone. You. Have a good night, everyone. Good night, thank everyone. You, we'll see you again in a month. Everyone, enjoy your holiday. Thank you, you so too. much. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.